Very good morning to you and thanks for joining us on The Run-Up. My name is Nyamgul Agaji and I also have my colleague here with me, Mr. Bayo Olowake. Good morning and welcome to the program, Bayo. Nyamgul and good morning viewers. It's a very pleasant day. Mm. I'm hoping it remains that way. Yeah, it's uh, every day we wake up and uh, we're like, we can't believe it. That is, it's just like today, it is only two days and a few hours to the general elections, the national elections as the president, uh, f uh, the presidency and the national assembly elections, uh, presidential rather, and the national assembly elections, just two days to there. Uh, what? What is it like where you are in your neck of the woods? How is preparations like? How are people taking it? How are people, uh, are they expectant? Or some of them are just thinking it's going to be a public holiday for them to play ball on the streets? No, I mean, people are taking this election very seriously. Um, in my neighborhood yesterday evening, we gathered together to talk as well. No, not all, all, all the time, uh, but we do this from time to time. And uh, it was a very lively discussion, uh, reviewing all the major candidates, reviewing their promises, looking at their campaigns, and um, yes, asking each other who we're going to vote for. <laughs> yeah. So I think people are very much interested. It's a defining moment. Interestingly, every election we've had, even the one I covered in 1979 as a reporter, a very, very young reporter, mm. That was a return to see who uh, from the passenger military government to the, the presidency of Alaji Shehu Shagari. Um, the, the, every election, you know, Nigerians have always said this is a defining election, very important election. So I don't know which election will not be important because every election in Nigeria is always important. But I think more so this one is particularly going to be exciting. Uh, so let's see what happens. Yeah, even though everyone has been really ex an exciting moment for Nigerians, but there are some that are really, really more so. Because, okay, for instance, the one you're talking about in 1979, who were leaving the military era and coming back to civil rule, and people were excited that democracy was returning. And then after we now went back to the military rule in 1999, we were returning to democracy, so the excitement was there. Not even 1999, 1993, uh, when we were supposed to have, when we had that election, everybody was, was very, very excited, maybe because of the people that were involved or the person that was involved. And then 1999, we were coming back to democracy after we thought that maybe we will not have democracy anymore. The excitement was high. And then somewhere along the line, a lot of people uh, began to show some apathy. They didn't want to uh, identify with the political class and the political process. But this one, it seems like new entrants have made it more exciting or have made it uh, feel like there is something really special about this one and everybody wants to go there. But it's unfortunate that in the days... Uh, before the election, all these things are happening. This violence everywhere, people looting in the name of cash uh, scarcity or currency scarcity or Naira scarcity. Some hoodlums are taking the opportunity to do a lot of bad things. I hear they burnt a lot of uh, banks somewhere and some people uh, have lost their lives and it's just very unfortunate. We thank God that at least, even though it's happening here in Lagos as well, the magnitude which people expected things like that to happen is not happening. And we will thank God for small mercies. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, the, the major worry had been the possible impact of the insurgency on, this, on the security situation. Mm. And I was just remarking to someone yesterday that a measure uh, of the success of the armed forces could be seen in the fact that campaigns have been conducted all over the country, yeah. in the nooks and crannies of the country. And um, things have gone relatively well. Yes, there see. have been very, 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 very few security incidents. Uh, and I think that's uh, 
that's a big commendation to the armed and security forces. Mm. Now, of course, we have had this um, COVID, sorry, I said COVID, we've had this uh, cash crunch inspired um, uh, violence, uh, which has been born out of frustration. Uh, and we are only hoping that the security agencies will be able to secure as many as of those vulnerable uh, locations as possible. Um, I think as well that the the excitement that you alluded to, uh, giving us a historiography of the elections we have had in the past and how the voting population had at one time or the other been quite excited, and then how there has been apathy, especially uh, over the past couple of years. Um, I think the apathy has should largely be be blamed on the two major political parties who could not have reinvented themselves to the point where they actually motivate the electorate, mm. you know, to, to be to be enthusiastic about elections. But of course, 2023 presidential election is turning out to be different. I think that because first of all, we have Alaji Atiku Abubakar, who is a serial contender mm. for the presidency. So he brings some sort of excitement into it. We also have Ashwa Jubal Ahmed, who had long aspired to be president. So that aspiration of his, and he's picking up the ticket of his party, I think also contributed to generating excitement, especially on the side of his followers. And then you have the third force, what is now being regarded as the third force, the Labour Party phenomenon of um, uh, uh, Peter B and uh, Dati uh, Baba Ahmed and their followers that have enlivened the political terrain and space and has actually provided a platform, seemingly provided a platform for the younger population to, to crystallize their ambitions, so to speak. So I think these are the reasons why we are having this heightened excitement and I think it is good for the country. Yeah, I, I, I'm very, I'm, I agree with you. It's very good for the country. And we do hope that, as everybody is saying that this is a, a defining moment, it really will be a defining moment. Interestingly, uh, of all the people who are like the top, top contenders, even if you count from one to four, they've all been governors except for Atiku Abubakar, who was a vice president. So he served in the capacity of a deputy, no matter how high that was. Uh, but uh, every other person has been a governor. We talk about... Uh, he, he was an elected governor, yeah. yeah but he, did. he was an elected governor. He was so elected, he never, but he never... He never yeah, but he never... Yes, because yeah. he was picked after he had been elected as governor of yes. Adamawa State. He was then picked by former president of Passenger to be his running mate. Yes. And at that, time, I, at that time, I applauded his courage because the question was, what if they lose? And now you already had, like, like they say, a bed at hand is what uh, a million in the bush. He had the governorship, but he let it go and he wanted to go and become president. And it was like, OK, this man has courage. This man has faith. I applauded him at that time. But let's see how it goes. I do hope that uh, the best man will win. Maybe this time we, will, will, we may not be praying that um, uh, let, us to get, let us get the leader we deserve. I, I don't even know how to put that because sometimes because of our own attitude, some people would say whoever we elect, we deserve, we deserve that person. What if the bulk of the people who are really thinking good for Nigeria are doing their best, but the people who are greedy are the ones that will influence it so much so that we have the man that we do not deserve. And then we go through the circle of another four or eight years of agony. I do hope that whoever is going to be elected will know that the people have power enough and they are important enough for him to sit up and do what is right. Well, today we'll be talking about the uh, manifestos of some of these uh, political parties, and we'll be having Alexa Wilcox, a public affairs analyst here in the house with us. Uh, we would have loved to take some numbers uh, from uh, the INEC, but uh, let's just take a break. When we return, we do a little more on uh, the, of what 
on what INEC has said so far about the election, the numbers as it were, people that are going to vote, how many people are going to vote, how many polling units that are in the country, how many people are standing for the election in the first place and all that. And it's two days and a few hours to the election proper. Remember that on the 25th of February, elections will hold for uh, the presidential elections and the National Ele uh, Assembly elections will hold on that day. And no matter what you might think, INEC has assured us and the security agencies have assured us that the elections will hold and it will be peaceful enough for Nigerians. So whoever you are, wherever you are, go out and vote so long as you can identify your polling unit. Let's take some numbers from INEC. Uh, we have 18 candidates so far vying for the presidency and analysts see three front, front runners and some people who are liberal enough see four. We have Atikwa Bubaka who is 76 years old of the People's Democratic Party, the main opposition party. A former vice president, Atikwa Bubaka ran in 2007 and 2009. He lost his party's primaries in 1993, 2011 and 2015. We also have 70-year-old Bola Tinubu of the ruling All Progressives Congress, a former legislator and two-time governor of Lagos State. Tinubu is nicknamed City Boy and the godfather of Lagos by supporters for his clout in Nigeria's economic capital. <laughs> then we have Peter Obi, who, is, uh, who was uh, the governor of Anambra State, who also uh, is contesting. His followers know themselves as obedience and they are the one of the majority among the youths who are clamoring for a different kind of Nigeria, a better kind of Nigeria. But today we're trying to look at the manifestos of especially these three and uh, if we may add another person, we will also be talking about Rabiu Kwankwaso, a former governor as well. Now, we'll be looking at this manifestos with our public analyst in the house here. Uh, we're being joined by Mr. Alexa Wel Wilcox. Welcome to the program, Mr. Wilcox. Thank you very much for having me. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Okay, so uh, now we have just a few days to the general elections. And in fact, the campaigns are going to stop. Will it be tomorrow or the day after? Uh, because campaigns cannot be carried on till the day of the election. Now we're trying to look at some key points in the manifestos of these frontline candidates. So far, uh, what would you, how would you rate their manifestos as regards the problems that Nigeria is facing and the solutions they are proffering for these problems? Well, in a nutshell, uh, if, you, if you ask me, uh, I have not had a question of reading the, of all of them back to back. I've only been able to read that of the APC president candidate, which, which is stuck with renewed hope. And if you look at that renewed hope, it was patterned after hope 19, part of the, the agenda of hope 93, which was the SDP manifesto of, uh, of, um, of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, Abiola. And so I know that uh, the current run, uh, president candidate of the APC was a big, uh, a major player at that time in drafting those, I'm sure he had a lot of input in those manifestos. So uh, he has to pattern and repackage them and I mean, we re reinvent that manifesto and bring it to reality, to current reality. So it's something that will give Nigerians a bit of comfort. The manifesto of the Labour Party, uh, it's also, uh, well, um, a bit catchy, uh, does not dealt deeply into some of the prevailing issues that needed to be wrong. I, I see it more as um, a manifesto that highlights most of the problems, you know, just keep highlighting the problem, highlighting the problem, and making most comparison with um, other countries. Uh, the PD manifesto, I, I must be frank, I've not read it, I've not seen, I've not read it, but uh, from what the, the, the President Kanye has been discussing in most fora, it talks more about, um, um, uh, I mean, the investing state enterprises. I mean, they have always been in that in that in that uh, direction. For instance, the PDP has always looking at the investing state enterprises and all what. And the current campaign has not shied from that from that uh, area. But apart from that, 
I did not see any. I just keep hearing, let's cover Nigeria, let's cover Nigeria, let's cover Nigeria. Uh, I've not seen clearly any, except you point out some for me, for me to be able to analyze any clear departure from what the PDP has always offered all these years. Okay, yeah, well, even, even at that, whether you've read it or not, um, like one of the, uh, the presidential candidates, I think that of Labour Party, used, uh, always says, before he brought out his manifesto, everybody was asking, bring your manifesto, let's see a document and all that. And he kept saying, it is not in the paper, it is not in the write-up, because I can produce a voluminous uh, document, but I may not be able to implement it, or I will not have the will to implement it. So now, our concern is even mostly about why sometimes we have a very beautiful manifesto, and then we still see that things do not move the way they should move and they do not achieve whatever is in their manifesto. For instance, the present administration, I don't know if the pillars on which they built this administration, uh, security, economy, corruption and all that, if they did anything in that regard that will give us some solace that people follow their manifesto. So the question is, what is that thing that makes people who have given a document and taken a, a vow with the people, a commitment to do something, what is it that prevents them from fulfilling the provisions of that document which is like a bond with the people that they are serving? What prevents our leaders from implementing provisions of their manifestos that people who are going to enter into government now should look out for and try to avoid? Well, um, first and foremost, what does manifesto serve? Manifesto serve as a kind of guide. Okay, so that is that was why when the obedient group was saying they don't need a manifesto, then the people were asking, so how do we assess you? Today, you can say, okay, this current government did not perform because they put out a document and you are holding that document and you are saying, based on this document, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. That is why a manifesto is necessary. So anybody that comes up to say it is not, it doesn't need a manifesto, just vote me in. And that so how do you assess him? So what is the assessment criteria? If the man did not give a manifesto, you have not assessed him about, he has not promised you anything. But when he gives you a manifesto, you can assess him and say, okay, the promise you gave me, you have fulfilled it, you have done it or you have not done it, then there's a piece of assessment. So that's what manifestos do. Now, manifestos are not cast in stone. Nowhere in the world will everybody implement what's in the mind. Because number one, you are given a manifesto when you are not on the driver's seat. It's just like somebody who takes a job as a marketer, and you promise the employer that you are going to deliver um, uh, 10 billion naira worth of uh, uh, sales uh, from your own calculation, sitting outside, and then by the time you get into the company, discover that they don't have a structure, the company has no structure, the company has no uh, uh, material for you to, uh, I mean, has no vehicle for you, the company has no, this, you know, there are limiting factors within the system, within the organization. So, what I will make you not know, to achieve that target that you've set for yourself. The company is a target. So, most often than none, no, no politician, no government that does not wish well for its people. It can be too, no government, even the worst of government, no one does not want to make a name. But, most times, when you get there, it's either the things you met on ground, and I will speak for this administration. I mean, when they are preparing a manifesto uh, in 2014 during the election, of course, the oil price then was at 120 to 140 dollar uh, dollar per barrel of oil, and Nigeria was doing well in terms of sales of oil. Although even at that point, it was not diving, and of course, they made a lot of promises based on that. They talked about the 5,000 naira cash transfer. They talked about building of uh, 13 number of roads. Uh, in that they talked of so many things, but you and I know that the moment when they came to power, the the narrative changed. Oil price noise died from one twenty dollars per barrel to sometimes less than thirty dollars. This it was solar twenty seven. Production reduces reduced, and so they had to do all kinds of things. I see sincerely. Uh, I'm not a politician. I'm not a part of this government, but. Um, Nigerians sometimes don't understand the workings of government or performance of government. I mean, they take one aspect of the issue. I mean, when the government came in, some states, even when oil was being sold at $120 per barrel, states were owing salaries. The federal government was owing salaries. 
The federal government, as at that time, was borrowing money to pay salaries. That was the kind of economy these people inherited, this government inherited. So when this government came, they were able to, I don't know how they did it, sincerely, I can't tell. They gave loans, grants to states to pay off salaries. They, 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 they reformed, they, 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 I mean, they did a lot of things to without those workers. And then they begin to implement certain things. Even the so-called, the, I mean, people are accusing them. They did part of what they proved, that is the, um, the empower scheme, where people were employed on, on, uh, on temporary jobs so that they can have income of 30,000 naira per, per month. They did that and they, and, and they employed over 500,000 Nigerians over the period. You know, so sometimes people don't appreciate some of these things. And then you are seeing where there are no income, no, I mean, the, the level of income reduced. It's just due to this social crisis that oil price went up. All through, they have been working on oil price far lower than what they, than what they met. And all that, then you now have the effect of other things like COVID that came in, some of that. So, if if Nigerians want to be fair in terms of assessing a the government, then it is not what verbatim written in the in the in the in the manifesto. You look at the manifesto, you look at what's available, you match them, and then you begin to give uh, a credence. So, no no nobody, no government, even the United States, will fulfill everything in the manifesto. No, even in Britain, we fulfill it as a manifesto. The manifesto is a guide. It's like saying a budget of a country. The budget is made. No, there's, there's well been a time a budget is performed 100 percent because there have been competing factors, there have been limiting factors. The important about manifesto is it gives you a guide and it gives the uh, the, the the public an assessment criteria to say, okay, based on your manifesto. You have done one, you have done two, you didn't do three, you didn't do four, you didn't do five. How do we how do we move from there? Are, are we, can we still trust you? Can we still renew your mandate? But if there's no manifesto, what am I going to adjudge you with? You just come and you do you do one road for me and you tell me oh, this all this is all I could do. I didn't promise you more than one road. I didn't even promise you anything. So that is why manifestos are and that was why the big group was asked, give us a manifesto. And they went up and brought up something that well they felt is a manifesto. And to their supporters, it's a manifesto. To the critical Nigerians, we want to see step by step as to how you want to achieve them. Okay, um, I'll leave you in the hands of Bio. Bio, your turn. Thank you, Yambu. Um, Mr. Wilcox, it's a pleasure having you again this morning. Um, I, I, I enjoyed talking with you. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's, let's interrogate uh, something you made, a point you made, and I would like you to, to expatiate on it. That, and I agree with what the, the assumption that, rather, the, the basis that you gave that so it's one thing to have a manifesto, it's another thing when you get into office, you know. But um, the, the candidates we are having, uh, almost all of them have been governors before. And the one who almost became a governor was vice president and was saddled with, at least in the first three years of the Obasanjo presidency, Atiku Abubakar. Uh, His Excellency Antiqua Bubaka was saddled with the task of running the economy. Now, they are all campaigning, uh, and, and I, I am of the view, I would like to get a perspective, I am on the view that these guys will have absolutely no excuse not to know what they are talking about. Why? Number one, we know what we are producing. As of today, our oil production has gone up to 1.6 million barrels. It was really bad last year because of what they called crude oil theft, okay, which basically involves so many other things. But at least today we are doing 1.6 million barrels a day, and this is on open sources. Secondly, we know how much we are owing, okay, and then we know how much we are earning from non-oil exports. Now, the almost all the parties except for Labour Party, they have governors, especially PDP and uh, PDP and APC. They, they have most of the governors in the, of the 36 states. And if your party has some governors, you have an idea of what the situation in each of those states are, even if you don't have information about anything else. So in my view, uh, Alaji, His Excellency Alaji Antiku Abubakar, His Excellency Ashwa Jibola uh, and even to a large extent, His Excellency uh, Peter Obi, they have been on the saddle. They understand what it is. And Haji Kwakwansu was also governor of Kanu, I think for two terms. He was minister of defense under President Obasanjo. So they shouldn't have an excuse 
not to be able to give us a manifesto that is reasonably in tandem with the reality of our socioeconomic situation as of today. What's your reaction to that? I, I am in total agreement with your position. As a matter of fact, um, for the first time, we are fortunate to have, like you said, um, persons who have um, held sway in executive capacities in their various states. Uh, and like you said, Atiku Abubakar, even though he was not, uh, uh, he didn't make the final call as a president or as a chief executive, he was uh, very influential. Like you said, the first three years, President Passenger was busy junketing the whole world, trying to <laughs> his statesmanship, and then he left yeah. the back end to Atiku, and Atiku really entrenched himself to the point that he wanted to challenge him in the 2003 election if not for some diplomacy and overtures and uh, trust uh, the, the Baba of Uwu, he knows how to stoop to conquer and all that. So if not so, I mean, the story would have been different because I, I think Abaka had the, had the momentum in his favor, the tide was swimming in his favor on the fact that uh, the president allowed him to have food. So he understands the issues. Now, they all understand the issues. Now, um, so that is why this election, and I was thinking that Nigerian should have Eschew some of the um, uh, some of the sentimental attachment to the candidacy, and some of the bigotry and sentimental attachment that we, we that that characterized the, the campaign. You know, that's I, I will look at Nigeria and looking at because this you are you are talking to you you are selecting from persons that have had executive positions. Have run, let's call it now, if it is companies, these are chief executives of companies. And there, they, 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 there should be a track record of what have this guy achieved as in this in company A. Now you're interviewing people for a job, and you want somebody to have a job. And I come with my CV. You are coming with your CV. So what have we done? And that's what, what, what I think Nigeria should have been looking at. Oh, okay, when I was going to Anambra State, I tamed the erosion. Oh, Anambra erosion that was threatening the entire Anambra. Yes, this is this is. Sweet. I met it at X. I tamed it to, to Y. And then somebody will tell me, oh, in Kanu, the pyramids came back on that. You know, we used to have the, the granite pyramids of Kanu. Oh, the, the pyramids came back, and I was able to build up. I, I mean, I, I built a legacy that people others are following, and this is where we are. Okay, in Lagos, I was able. I met Lagos at this. I, 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 I have never to tame the barbage that, that was spending about three billion every year, and I have put in structures that has brought people to this is where we are, this is where we are. Mm -hmm. And then people should look at this. Are what, so in drafting manifesto, it should be around these achievements. And like you said, they all have governors in their states. They all have uh, governors in their in their in their in their in, in their asthana. Their yeah, parties. So, yeah. Yes, and these governors have data. And so that is why your manifesto should have reflected those data. And that's why I said, when uh, Obi had to hurry his manifesto, saying that he doesn't need a manifesto, and, and Nigerians were shouting, they had to hurriedly put something in place. Then uh, I see it as something that you cannot hold somebody accountable because it does not have any in-depth analysis. Not that I'm derogating the, the party. It doesn't have any in-depth analysis. Like when you compare it to the renewed hope. Now, this is somebody that has that has been wanting to be president. Okay, so I'm talking about uh, he relinquished his, uh, sometimes his, let me say his rights to want to run and prop up others. And so he, he, he was, he had something he wants to do. I also give that article. Article also has been wanting to be president since 2003. So he has something he wants to do. Obi well, wanted to be vice president, who was vice president in 2019, tried to be president, I mean, felt he, he had the momentum, and then when he had to see that PDP was not giving the ticket, he ran to the Labour Party, and the youth found him interesting. So, was he prepared, or was he coming with the rave of the moment? You know, I, were you prepared for Abini show that I want to be president? As a matter of fact, Kwakwansu has been prepared. Kwakwansu started Talking of being president, 2014, he ran for the uh, for the um, APC um, primaries in 2014. 
In 2015, he ran in 2019, he ran for the PDP primaries. So Fakansu has been wanted to be president. Even Shawari has been wanted to be president. Mm -hmm. I mean, he has been he has, he has wanted to be president. Uh, so Obi just decided to be president in 2023. Okay. After serving as governor, he went back to his business until Atiku asked him to be vice president, running mate to him. And then, so these are the things that Nigerians should look at. And for me, unfortunately, we have left those, those basic things for the sentimentals. Okay, um, can, I, can I, can I, can I, can I, can I, religion, we look at tribe, tongue yeah. by tongue, religion, tribe, which are some of the things that <laughs> does not build a nation, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, just can I follow up on that? During the presidential debates, we saw journalists interviewing. I'm not even sure if they were interviewing or posing questions. So I want your perspective. Did you think that those who anchored the presidential debates sufficiently prepared to grill the candidates? Or do you think the candidates had an easy ride so whether it's governorship or presidential debates, it was just like they were just there and they just had time. They, nobody really subjected them to But I mean, let me not bias your thinking, but how do you think those debates went? And did, did we in the media help in any way to challenge or to grill these candidates for Nigerians to understand their manifestos better? You see, um, the time of... Um most, I, I will say with due respect to the media, the time we had the media, the real media is fast depleting and fast going. Um, like I said last time I was here, we have a lot of uh, AOPs that call themselves media practitioners. And sometimes um, their editorials or what they do is influenced by their political beliefs and political leanings. And so we lost the fact that um, we are supposed to project all debaters, for me, have never met uh, a, a, an average threshold, not talking of surpassing the threshold, because sometimes it's mediocre. It's, I mean, and it's, it's a mediocre thing. You you ask questions that, um, that like you said, easy right. Or then you choose to embarrass one candidate against the other, depending on the area that you want. You choose to give a candidate. Look, I, I, I don't miss the US debates, the presidential de uh, debates. They, they, they always have three. One, you sit down. The other, you stand. The other, you ask yourself questions. And you have ample opportunities. And there are follow-up questions. The questions are not sent in advance. The questions are asked based on your past records. The questions are asked based on your character. Character. And the unfortunate thing in this community, we ask of character. When we ask questions on character, we say it is insult. We say, oh, it is, it is insult. And no. You ask questions based on character. Based on business, I mean, your past activities, and then subject your plan to uh, uh, economic and political uh, uh, realities and questions on those lines. You, are, you don't, uh, you don't, you don't, you don't share, you don't ask somebody how many roads will you build, where will you get the money. Those are not, as far as I'm concerned, those are, those are, those are, those are what local government debate should be looking at. You, you look, you need to interrogate the people. Okay, with respect to this and this and this, what are your plans on this and this? You saw the kind of question that came out at Chatham House for all the candidates that went there. That's the kind of question I expect people to ask. But um, not to not to shy away the fact that um, uh, I, I'm not I'm not trying to rubbish the media. But sincerely speaking, the media has the, the standard of the media in Nigeria has gone down. Uh, political lenient and sentiment has overridden most objectivity. And then, um, like uh, uh, his, uh, like um, uh, Clark said, that the, the, I mean, the, 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 the renowned lawyer in one of the programs, he was so bitter and he called the media all kinds of names, and which really uh, it ought not to be. You don't, you don't, you don't, you don't treat national issues based on uh, political sentiment. Even in US, they have media organizations. Even in the UK, media organizations have. Uh, uh, affiliate biases to candidate, but they don't show it when they are presenting their questions in terms of debates. They, they make sure that they give the, the audience the best and to bring out the real characters of the candidates. 
not the sentimental character, not your problem, the real character of the candidate and the real plans the candidates have. Subject these plans. Now somebody is telling me I want to I want to we will move from consumption to production. I have not seen any media has that have interrogated P2B and said, please sir, what is the consumption we are doing now? And what is the production you are taking us to? Tell me the consumption. Now tell me the production and what is the and what is the process? But everybody just flying to town. I have consumption to production. Consumption is that is that for me is too nonsensical. You know, and no media house has interrogated those questions, and that's what the youth are flying on. The youth that are uh, that are that are the main uh, fulcrum of the video of the video movement. Oh, that is what they all fly on production to uh, consumption to production. Meanwhile, they are the bigger consumer of all that we are talking about today. Consumption of mm -hmm. electronics, consumption of uh, passion, consumption of uh, the things that are the place of our external reserve. The youth today are the biggest consumers of it, and then. You are not on the fact that somebody say you want to move from consumption to so are you going to stop using iPad, uh, iPhone 13 Plus, Pro Max? Are you going to stop using Brazilian hair? That are you going to stop using all those important? So what is the what is the forefront of that uh, uh, statement? Consumption to production. So so mm. and and we are not interrogating it, but you know we are flying with it. <laughs> that will be okay. saying to change from consumption to production. I mean, okay, and, I and guess the media house, the, the the media, the mainstream. It's not even interrogating that statement. Mm. I guess we will grow as the as our democracy unfolds. Um, at least we are seeing more of the uh, of the uh, debates now, uh, and your, your observations are well noted. Uh, I know there are areas in which we can improve as well, uh, you know, and and hopefully let's let's see let's hope that uh, as our democracy evolves, and especially as sooner or later we'll go to local government elections after this one, in each state, maybe we'll begin to actually put these things into practice because that is where government is closest to the people. And that interrogation of whoever wants to be a local government chairman should also be extremely important. Uh, I close with a question. Um, do you think the ordinary Nigerians have, well, in a way you've alluded to that, but you were using the Labour Party as an example. But if we look at all the political parties now. Do you think Nigerians actually understand the manifesto of these parties? I mean, in the Second Republic, for instance, with the UPN, with the NPN, you knew what you knew what uh, the manifesto. Everybody knew what the manifestos were. And UPN was free education, qualitative ed um, health, uh, free healthcare, integrated rural development. NPN was uh, qualitative education, green revolution. You could recite this you know, off the top of your head. Do you think we, our parties this time around have sufficiently left a mark in the consciousness of the electorate that the electorate can just reel off what each one stands for? In fact, you just gave me good spin posts right now. And when I remember the four <laughs> card now, the four card now point of the UPN, uh, it, it just gave me good spin posts, I tell you. Uh, no matter how young I was, young I was then, I could recite the four cardinal of, uh, points of the UPN, uh, 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 and I could I could really connect with that of the MPN, even that of the MPP. As, yeah. as, as at that time, you can you can you can you can really. I, I mean, that is when rationality plays a lot a major a, a lot of role in our consciousness. That is when the the mainstream media, you get your source from just the mainstream media. All this noise on social media, the social media has caused a lot of disruption of our psyche, of our mental structure, that people do not even bother to read. That just, you, this is the first time I am I am appearing on a program to analyze manifesto of the parties. This is the first time. How many media houses has, how many media even know the manifesto of the, uh, of the PDP? Of the NMPP, how many media have seen Shewere's manifesto? That is Shewere's party. I don't even remember the name of this party. How many media have seen his manifesto? So how do that connect to the people? And today, people are biased with a lot of things. For instance, we, like I said, we bring in religion. Uh, people are saying Muslim Muslim ticket, Christian Muslim ticket, Christian. Bring in religion that is that has nothing to do with development, nothing to do with with. The price of gary in the market or the cost of ram in the nothing to do with it and people are using that to run and not looking at the manifesto of what we are talking about 
So how many people are looking at that? Today, look, 2014 election was even, is even, was even far better because there was a manifesto and people were, which was being sold. And people were looking at the manifesto because they wanted something different. Today, a lot of us are saying they want something different. Have you even read a manifesto of that different thing you are looking for? I'm talking about the youths now. That say, oh, we want something. Have you read a manifesto? I ask some people, what is the Labour Party's manifesto? Uh, Conversion to production. I mean, and how shall you? So to if tomorrow, and you happen to get your candidate elected, and then, so what are you expecting him to do? What 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 are the deliverables? Yes, someone was telling me uh, the price of uh, corn will come down. Someone was showing me coconut yesterday that if we bring wins, the price of coconut will come down from seven hundred to two hundred. I said how? And he will don't worry, he will do it. You know. So we have and these are these are these are not kids. I'm talking about adults. So it don't even connect to it. What is the policy on education? What is the policy on health? What how are we going to? What's the policy on energy? They, nobody connects to it. And so we need the media, the mainstream media, to go above the social media, to go above the noise, and begin to highlight to Nigerians. We have too many media houses. 80% of them into uh, socials, music, sports, the music, blah, blah, all those films, all those movies. But the ones that are what they are sought should come back to the mainstream of information, informing the people, not just entertaining them, informing the people of what they should do. Last time I came, I talked about N uh, the National Research Agency that has the responsibility Unfortunately, they have gone to sleep. They are not, they exist on paper, they exist on budget, they go to and defend their budget, but not service to Nigerians, no service to the country. This needs to change. And we need to look at people's manifesto. We need to make informed political decisions. Yes, there is sentiments, no, no doubt, nobody will rule that out. There is biases, nobody will rule that out. But again, in the midst of those confusions, you are also entitled to have some element of responsibility as to what you can hold somebody accountable for. And that is the person's manifesto. If you don't have it, if you don't understand it, if you don't have any uh, direct uh, political uh, decision made based on that, you have no choice to be, you have no right to complain okay. when the chips are done. Okay, Mr. Wilcox, let me, let me just come in there. Uh, if you may, in, in, in less than a minute, uh, let's just be fast about it, the time is gone. Um, it's, it appears uh, that the people's function in implementation of this manifesto is really, really very key. And a lot of people don't seem to know how to go about it, holding this our our elected representatives accountable to their actions and everything that they need or they have promised in the manifesto. For instance, in Lagos State, we have uh, someone who is contesting and saying that he moved Lagos State from, uh, from, from a low-income uh, state, as it were, comparatively, to where they were earning $50 billion per month. And we don't know how that was achieved. We don't know how, after achieving that, that money was spent and all that. So we are not taking enough responsibility. What do, do we need to do to be able to tell the people that we understand what you have told us and the level you have reached, but we need more? What else can the people do, Nigerians, the citizens who are electing these people, to make sure they are more transparent than they are right now? Because whatever they want to give us is what they give us, but whatever they don't want us to know, we seem not to know how to go about finding out. What do you think the electorates need to do beyond election to make sure the manifesto is not only implemented, but we know how it is implemented and how whatever implementation, whatever implementation uh, it, it has achieved has changed the life of the people? What do we need to do? Very short. short. Yeah. Well, changing the life of the people is relative. It depends on your own perception of how your life has changed, sincerely. For instance, if you can drive your car um, on the on the motorable road without potholes and you go less to the mechanic, your life has changed. If you can, if 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 uh, if uh, if you can, if you can have um, your street 
having new buildings and new after your life has changed. So it's relative. Sometimes we don't measure these areas. Uh, we want to look at how much money is in our pocket. But again, um, citizens journalism is very key. Sincerely, citizen journalism is very key. And pressure groups are very, very key because you cannot on your own, one-on-one, -on -one, go to allow us out, go to the governor, go to the president to say, look, I want to see why you have done this. So that's why it had to do with citizen journalism and collective responsibility. Yeah. You know, peer pressure groups and the media. The media is critical because it is them that, that they are the fourth step of the ring that determines. They are, they are beyond the, they are the, 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 the legislature, the judicial, the executive. They are the one that is helping to hold accountable. But when the media is compromised and they can and 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 they chicken out when they're supposed to stand, then that's a problem. If you cannot speak the truth to power, if you cannot organize uh, uh, groups that can that can use their platform to express and to put government in their on their toes, then we we'll, then we'll all fail because it's not what Alesta or yourself can walk up to allow us or walk up to Asura and say, let me see the record, let me see how you end this, let me see what you're no, I can't do that, we can't do that. But again, we need to have citizen journalism, citizen pressure, the media pressure, the media provide their platforms for groups to use, to put, the, to put out their messages, responsible messages, and to follow up. And above all, avoid compromise. Yeah. Most of them that know we get compromised. True. If we're not compromised, we can stand and speak the truth. But when you are compromised, you have lost your balance and you can no longer do anything. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Alexa Wilcox, for coming on the show. Each time you come, it always gladdens us. We hope that uh, we'll talk more it's with you. It's always a pleasure. Thank, thank you. God bless Nigeria. Yeah. As we go out of votes, let us make it a wise choice. God bless Nigeria, and may God continue to protect our troops. Thank Amen. You. Amen to that. Okay, we've been talking with Mr. Alex Wilcox, a public affairs analyst, and uh, we were trying to look at manifesto, its effects, and how much uh, we, we know about these manifestos and how it will affect us in the future, more or less. Um, well, we will return to wrap it up, Bio, with, <laughs> with all the things that uh, Alexa has raised. But first of all, we now go for a short break to enable us bring you the news. When we return, we x-ray the things that we've heard already and the things that are yet to come. Stay with us. <laughs>